If you're able to stand, would you do so, please, as we read from John 18:39. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I have found no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. Shall we pray? Lord, as we read these verses, we are just overwhelmed to understand what you were willing to do for us because you loved us and you wanted a way for us to have a relationship with you. Thank you. And I pray that as we prepare our hearts and minds to listen to what Pastor has from these verses, your word, that we would be open to your spirit drawing us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. This is part two of our, of our king. Have you ever sat on a jury? The job of a jury is to listen to the evidence and to decide whether the person is innocent, or I should say not guilty, or guilty. They never like the word innocent because nobody's innocent, right? It's not guilty. But years ago, I sat on a jury... And the case was, was a trespassing case. It just seemed kind of trivial to me uh, that they would be bringing up charges against this person uh, on trespassing. And it wasn't like he was on private property. He was too close to the railroad track. He was on railroad property. And the railroad people, well, the police, arrested him because he wouldn't leave. You know, he was just giving him a hard time. So they arrested him uh, because he was too close and it was dangerous, right, for him to be there. And so they arrested him and, and uh, so they gave all evidence and, and here's the police officer telling the story. 
and the man didn't defend himself or anything. Uh, but uh, we go into the jury room and some of the people were feeling compassion. And they said, well, you know, this is not really a big deal. W you know, we should just find him not guilty and let him go. And I said, well, it's, that's not our job. Our, our job is to determine whether he was there or not. Let the judge deal with what the sentence is. That's not our job. We just de de determine whether he was there or not. And so, okay, fine. So we went through the, the motions and, and of course he was guilty. And, uh, that, but it was, it was hard for some people to actually, you know, say that he was guilty just because they were feeling compassion for this man, right? What, what had he done? Everybody's walked on the railroad tracks before, right? Have you walked on the railroad tracks? I, I have. Um, it's just one of those things, right? that we all kind of do, and, uh, but yet it wasn't our job as a jury to decide whether you know, we should let him go or not. It was, what, was he there or not? And we said, yes, he, he was there. So um, that was the end of the story as far as we were concerned, and we, were, we did our job. In this case, Jesus is not guilty. And there is this person Pilate, who knows it. He knows that Jesus is not guilty. And last week, we even determined that Jesus was without sin, that he was sinless, and he never sinned. And so here is a man, Pilate, who is taking Jesus, not guilty, knowing full well, and condemning him to die on a cross anyway. And the, the, the non-jury jury, right, uh, these people, the, the chief priests and some sort of a crowd had, had uh, come to the place where Jesus was being tried. And they cried out, crucify him, someone who is not guilty. But I think that what we find here in this text is something very important because the not guilty took the place of the guilty. And the best picture of that is Barabbas. So here's Barabbas, right? Our substitute. Jesus is our substitute for Barabbas and for all of us. So we have a king that is willing to be our substitute. So let's talk about Barabbas a little bit. Uh, here in verses 39 and 40 of chapter 18. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they cried again saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Now, Pilate was all through this seemingly trying to release Jesus. I mean, in many cases, he would come out and say, look, I don't find any fault with him. Are you sure you really want to do this? Yes, we want, to, we want him crucified. And he seems to want to let Jesus go, but he doesn't. A miscarriage of justice, isn't it? Where he wants to do this, but he can't. And we know why, right? Because Jesus needed to go to the cross and he needed to die in order to pay for our sin. But, but here is Pilate. Actually, he's trying to release Jesus, but he does it in a way that inflames the crowd, especially the chief priest, because he, he says this, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? I mean, of all things, right, that he says... That is what's going to get them the, the most to want Jesus dead even more. Because they don't want to acknowledge that Jesus is their king. And of course, that's what we do, right? We acknowledge that Jesus is our king. 
uh, those of us that have put our faith and trust in Jesus, we know that he is our king and we gladly acknowledge that he's our king. The, the Jews who didn't follow Jesus, they wanted him dead. They didn't want to have anything to do with him and they didn't want to acknowledge that he was their king. So Pilate was not honoring Jesus when he said, do you want me to release your king, right? The king of the Jews. In fact, he was using that as an opportunity to bring Jesus down, to, to defame Jesus. Actually, I was thinking that's blasphemy. He was blaspheming the name of Jesus by calling him the king of the Jews in jest not because he actually believed that Jesus was the king of the Jews, but because he was just uh, trying to stir them up all the more. But Pilate had given a choice between Barabbas and Jesus. And, and uh, when we read these, these two verses from, Ma uh, from John chapter 18, we just kind of get the impression that, that out of the blue these individuals just started cr crying out, give us Barabbas in instead. But, he, but Pilate actually brings Barabbas up before they make this decision. And so uh, we read from Matthew uh, a little bit about that. It says, therefore, when he had gathered them together, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? Now, the chief priests were the ones who stirred up the crowd in order to get them to, on their, on their side to call for Jesus' crucifixion versus the, the release of Barabbas. And we read about that in Mark chapter 11. Or sorry, chapter 15, verse 11. It says, but the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Now, this is important because what we find is that, that uh, there's, there's a choice being presented. And I think that Pilate just wanted to put like the worst character in front of them on purpose. Like, who, who could we pick that would be a complete contrast to Jesus and who is it that I could put forward that surely they wouldn't want released that they would pick Jesus instead Here, here's your choice right Barabbas a robber or Jesus the king of the Jews now what we find out from the from a, a, a different text that actually Barabbas is a murderer. Look at what it says in Luke. It says, Therefore, Pilate, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them, but they shouted. Oh, I, I, it's, it's the next one, the next verse. I'm getting ahead of myself. But there was one named Barabbas who was claiming that this fellow rebels, that his fellow rebels, they had committed murder in the rebellion. So not only was Barabbas a robber, but he was a murderer. Now this is important, right? Because we've got Jesus who's innocent, not just not guilty, but innocent. And you have a murderer and a robber put forward. Who do you pick? And what do they pick? They pick Jesus to be murdered and they have Barabbas, a murderer, to be released. Now, I think about that, right? Uh, they are shouting for Jesus' death. Pilate wishing to release Jesus again. This is from Luke chapter 23. But they shouted again saying, crucify him, crucify him. That's all they wanted was a crucified. Now think about this, right? A week before, Jesus comes into the city and hail king of the Jews. And they wanted to make him king. And of course, that's not the plan, 
right? The plan is for him to die on the cross. He's still the king, but he's going to die on the cross first. And, and just a few days later, not even a whole week, we're only talking about five days, and there they are, crucify him, crucify him. And, and it's the chief priest stirring them up. Now, there's fear involved with that, right? The mob mentality. They know that if they go against what the chief priests are saying, they're going to be in trouble. They're going to be ostracized from the temple worship. They could be uh, cast out of the synagogues. In fact, there was already a threat against the man who was born blind. Uh, we already talked about a few, a couple of months back, the man born blind, and the parents were to testify that he was born blind. How did he get his sight? And they, that anybody who, who acknowledged Jesus was the Christ would be kicked out of the synagogue. So this, there's a great repercussion going on here if they were to side with Jesus versus siding with the chief priests. And if you're not convinced of who Jesus really is, you're, you'd go along with the crowd. But we who know who Jesus is, right, and, and confess him freely that he is the king of our lives, then we would, of course, want Jesus released. So here is, is uh, Mark telling us about Bar, uh, Barabbas. And Jesus was being put to death. And what we find also is that it was because of their envy of Jesus that the chief priests wanted him dead. And that's what Mark 15.10 says. For he knew, that's Pilate, knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. Now, if you think about what that, what that means is that Jesus had crowds, thousands of people who followed him around. Literally, thousands of people. And especially when he was entering into Jerusalem just a few days earlier on a Palm Sunday. As he enters into Jerusalem, there's literally a million people in and around Jerusalem. Some have, have, have estimated even more than that, but they've estimated at least a million people. So you have all these people coming that are all around Jerusalem. Jerusalem is small. It's a small town, right? Very small. You could walk around Jerusalem, no problem, uh, in a day. Not, not an issue. Right? It's, it's, the real estate that it takes up is very small. And yet there's a million people knowing and hearing this roar that's going on when Jesus enters into the city and goes into the temple. And over the next few days is preaching in the temple freely. And here we have a crowd and they've been swayed by the chief priests to crucify Jesus. Now I like to think about this as a picture of our sin and what we deserve, right? All of us deserve death for sin that we've committed. Now you might say to yourself, oh, I, I'm not so bad. You might say, well, I've never killed anyone. I've never murdered anyone. But you know, our hearts are deceitful above all things, as J Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17, 9. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. And so when Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he started to equate the external with the internal. Our external sins to the internal sins. Because sometimes we think of the Ten Commandments as something that's all external, right? Don't lie. Don't commit adultery. I've never committed adultery. And then Jesus says, look, if you just look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. So, so Jesus took the law and internalized it. It's not just the external things. It's the the, our heart condition that is what condemns us. And, and in, when it comes to murder, right, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 
21. None of us have murdered anyone, I hope. Don't raise your hand if you have. <laughs> and Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Oh, I've been angry, but I have always have a reason. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, that's you fool, right? Shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. So Jesus internalizes and he says, basically, you be angry without a cause. Um, and, and there's another place that says, if you hate your brother, right? Uh, it's same as murder. So just the way we interact with other people, we are guilty of murder. Just the same as Barabbas, who was involved in some insurrection and committed murder and was a robber and we're no better. And I, I like to, to think of this picture as, as a beautiful picture of how that Jesus took our punishment in our place. We deserve death, but Jesus paid for our sin in full because he was innocent and he took the punishment for us. And that's exactly what he did for Barabbas. I wonder what happened to Barabbas. I always wonder if Barabbas realized later what actually happened. And it's interesting because his, he, he's named in Scripture so people would know who he was. And they could always identify, there's, there's that guy that was released. I wonder if he put his trust in Jesus. We don't know. But it's, but uh, he should have. <laughs> if he didn't, he should have. And just the same for all of us. And, and I don't know if where your heart is and if you've put your trust in Jesus or not, but I, I wouldn't leave here today without doing that. Uh, because Jesus did something incredible by dying on the cross to pay for your sin. None of us are good because our hearts are desperately wicked. Who can know it? But here in this text, we've, we learn a, a little bit more about what our king did for us. Not only did he, was he our substitute, but he also suffered. In the next nine verses, we begin to understand the suffering that Jesus went through. Pilate thought that if he could punish Jesus, that that might change their minds. I really think that the punishment that Jesus took here is a, an attempt by Pilate to appease them to some degree. He thought, if I just beat Jesus up a bit, uh, maybe they'll, they'll have compassion on him. And so thus it begins the, the scourging, which is described in verse 1 of chapter 19. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. The Romans had the most cruel punishments. The cross was a slow death, uh, but the torture of the scourging would have been unbearable. The Jews had the 40 lashes minus one uh, because they didn't know if they would lose count, so they always did less than 40. They could go up to 40. But the Romans had no limit. They could scourge as much as they wanted, as much as, and oftentimes someone would die by the scourging, and they didn't care because that was their way. It was cruel. And the soldiers began to mock Jesus with this crown of thorns and a purple robe, as, as described in, in verse 2. The, the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they blasphemed Jesus and struck him. Verse 3, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him 
with their hands. Pilate thought this would appease them, and so he uh, takes Jesus out there and tries to show Jesus to them. And he says, He went out again and said, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Well, why did you beat him then? Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. Now, Pilate is presenting Jesus as a man. And it's a, a true statement, but an incomplete statement, isn't it? Because he is describing Jesus as a man, and we understand that Jesus is fully man, but fully God at the same time. It's God putting on humanity. We don't have time to go into the hypostatic union where you've got God, fully God, fully man, but this is the king, God the king, and we have God the man who is beaten and bruised and put to death for us. The chief priests called for Jesus' crucifixion again in verse 6. Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate then said, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault with him. Now, Pilate knew already in, from our discussion last week that they couldn't put anyone to death, and yet here he is poking at him again and trying to get them to, uh, to cave in and let Jesus go. For he knew they didn't have authority, and so he uses his, this opportunity to show contempt. And the Jews said something that shook up Pilate very badly in verse 7. The Jews answered and said, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself out the Son of God. So even in this text, we see Pilate saying, Behold the man. And we see Jesus' words being brought back that he is the Son of God. And when Pilate heard this, he, he was struck with fear, verse 8. Therefore, when Pilate heard this saying, he was more afraid. And he should be. When you think about Greek mythology and the demigods roaming the earth like Hercules and Achilles, uh, he would have been familiar with those, those uh, myths, right, where you've got a demigod, uh, and, uh, and this is no demigod, right? We have God in the flesh, not a Hercules or Achilles or one of the other uh, Greek myth, myth, mythology, you know, um, creatures. Even Pilate's wife warned him about Jesus in Matthew chapter 27 verse 19. When he was sitting in the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with this man for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. Pilate continued with the trek that he was on even though it brought great fear and he should have feared because he is in great danger uh, of judgment. And, of course, he was judged himself. Just n not long after this whole crucifixion, uh, Pilate fell out of favor, and they erased his name from everything. In fact, historians started believing that Pilate never existed and started saying things like, Pilate there's no such person as Pilate. And so they were trying to cause the Bible to, to uh, be put into question. But you know what's funny? Is that there was a memorial that was set up, a plaque that was set up for Pilate. And it's, and it's got his name on it and all this stuff about him and what he accomplished as a... As a uh, something that was um, you know, honoring him. But what happened was after he fell out of favor, they took that, that plaque and they made it into a bench 
as part of one of the, 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 the amphitheaters that were there. And the current king would sit on it <laughs> in the king's booth. They made that plaque a, a seat, kind of as a, a reminder. And so when they were doing some archaeological digs, they found the plaque and they made a replica and put it out so everybody could see it. But what's great about that is that just vindicates the Bible, doesn't it? That there was such a person as Pilate. And he did do this. But all through this, what we find is that even though he tried to release Jesus, he couldn't. So here is Pilate going back to Jesus. He says, who we went into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. All this was to fulfill prophecy. Even in his silence, he was fulfilling prophecy. Look at what it says in Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus had opportunity over and over and over to defend himself. He only answered questions when it was directed at who he was. Are you the king of the Jews? Yes. What have you done? Silence. Not even to defend himself. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would be whipped in Isaiah 53, verse 5, and he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So when Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, that's Isaiah 53, verse 5. Jesus suffered for us. And his body was broken for us. Each month we celebrate the Lord's table, right? The Lord's Supper. And the bread is that picture of Jesus' body broken for us. That's what Pilate did when he had Jesus scourged. Jesus' body was broken. And of course, Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says this in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four And when he had given thanks, he had broken it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That was before it happened. Jesus said that the night before it happened. And I'm sure that it was engraved in, their, in the disciples' minds their rest of their lives, what they'd seen and what and the 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 lord's table as it was prescribed as an ordinance for the church and it's his blood that was shed for us that saves us that's what hebrews 9:22 says and according to the law almost all things are purified with blood without the shedding of blood there is no remission or forgiveness that's the word remission so his blood needed to be applied to our hearts just as the blood of the lamb was applied over the door, doorpost in, uh, on Passover, that first Passover in Egypt. So how do we apply the blood of the lamb of Jesus to our hearts? We put our faith and trust in him. And we believe that his blood paid for our sin. The Bible tells us that he was beaten so badly that he was unrecognizable. Isaiah 53, verses 1, 2, and 3. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and has a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
and he hid, as it were, our faces from him, yet he, dis he was despised and he did not esteem them. For us, we must recognize that our sin put Jesus on that cross. Every sin is enough to condemn us to eternal punishment, but we've not just committed one sin. We've committed thousands, probably millions, if we were to ever keep track. And I'm glad we don't. All the more reason for us to repent and put our faith and trust in Jesus. So our king is our substitute. He also suffered for us. And lastly, I, I put this in future tense, he will judge Pilate was angry with Jesus because he didn't answer him, so he threatened him in verse 10. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? And of course, we know that this is laughable because we know Jesus' response, right? And here we have Jesus answering, You could not, you could have no power at all against me unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Now, we could go into that whole, you know, greater sin, lesser sin, but sin is sin, isn't it? And we, we don't need to split hairs today on that because we'd run out of time very quickly. But the point here is that they're all guilty. All of them are guilty. Pilate's guilty. And it's the power of God that put Pilate in that position in the first place and took him out. All because Jesus needed to go to the cross. The Jews and the Gentiles bear responsibility for Jesus' death. You know, they're the anti-Jewish, anti anti-Semites, right? There's, a, there's this big thing going on, and especially in the Catholic Church, the Jews put Jesus on the cross and killed him. So they hate the Jews because Je the Jews killed Jesus. Well, the Gentiles have just as much <laughs> culpability as the Jews, so why pick on just the Jews? Why don't you just hate everybody for putting Jesus on the cross? In fact, it's better yet, let's just thank God that Jesus did die on the cross so that we can have forgiveness. Because without Jesus' death on the cross, we would not have forgiveness. So we're all guilty of putting Jesus on the cross. And Pilate had no power whatsoever to even release Jesus if he wanted to. Verse 12. For then, from, from then on, Pilate sought to release Jesus, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Therefore, Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. And of course, that's the treason thing they were bringing back up again that we talked about last time. So he's a weak governor, and he yielded to their demand, and that's where verses 13 and 14 come in. Then Pilate therefore heard the saying, he brought Jesus out and sat him down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. So earlier it was behold your man. Behold the man. Now it's behold your king. And the Jews demanded again that Pilate crucify Jesus. Verses 15 and 16. Then they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate then said, shall I crucify your king? The pre chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then, they, then he delivered them to be him to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. That's what Pilate did. That was Pilate's whole job, was to release Jesus, and he didn't. Kings of old, did you know that kings of old were ju actual judges? You know, when I was reading the Old Testament, it kind of, made me realize that 
the job of the king was to judge. That was their job. We often think of kings leading wars and all this, but when they weren't out uh, protecting their land and leading their troops, they were actually judges. And they judged the people personally. And it's interesting, there's, a, there's an account in 2 Samuel uh, in chapter 15 where Absalom, Absalom is hanging out at the gate and the people are standing in line to see David, the king, for judgment. So they're all waiting around all day long and David's doing who knows what and judging people but it's taking too long and so Absalom comes around and says if you come to me I would give you judgment swift and right and he kept doing that over and over and over again and the people started to sway towards Absalom you can read about that in second Second Samuel chapter 15. I just put a couple of the verses that were important up for you to see. It says, And Absalom would say to them, Look, your case is good and right, and there is no uh, deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that I would be made judge in the land, and everyone who has any suit or cause could come to me, and I would give them justice. And so it was, whenever anyone came near to bow down, uh, to bow down to him that he would put out his hand and take them and kiss them. So Absalom won the hearts of the people because he was promising that he would be a good judge. Solomon, of course, we know that he was a good judge and a wise judge because that whole situation with the two harlots and the dead baby and split the baby, you, you know that account? If you don't, uh, you should. And, uh, and they are, uh, this whole situation with Solomon, he is judging personally the cases. So that was the, that's the job of the king, to be the judge. There's no jury, it's one guy, boom. This is what it is, this is what we're doing. Even Paul appeared, uh, a appealed to Caesar. That's the highest king in the, like the emperor. And he says, I'm going to go see him. Not these lesser people. I'm going straight to the top. So, so the king would dispense justice. And, and that's exactly what Jesus is going to do in the tribulation. And I think we're close to the rapture of the church and also the tribulation beginning, and God's wrath is being poured out on the unrepentant. And then Jesus will come at the end of the tribulation and judge. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man, come, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne, uh, on the throne of his glory, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the ones from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. That whole passage talks about that judgment that's going to take place. And of course, the unrepentant are going to be judged, right, with eternal punishment in hell. So, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. We have a judge who is going to judge fairly and right. And it's only those that are covered by the blood of Jesus who are have... Uh, put their faith and trust in Jesus, right? The doorposts are going to escape. And it's only because of God's grace 
and his mercy that we can escape it all. So those of us who have a relationship with God have Jesus as our advocate. I hope that if you're here today that you have already repented of your sin and you've put your trust in Jesus. But I don't know your heart. Uh, and if you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please, please, I beg of you, put your trust in Jesus today. And you know, some of us might even go along for years and years thinking that we're saved and we're really not. And I want us to search our hearts this morning and make sure that you really are part of the family of God. Because there are some who are going to come at the end and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't mean to do all these things in your name. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. That's, that's the scariest verse in the Bible. And I don't want pride to stand in the way. If, you, if you've declared to be a, a safe person and you say, I'm a Christian and you stand with the rest of us and then you get struck today with the realization that you're really not. Don't let pride say, well, I've already told everybody I'm saved so I can't make that public. I think that you should come clean and Put your faith and trust in Jesus. And I'll baptize you all over again. Because the first time was just getting wet. If you've been baptized. If you haven't, then, uh, you know, we can do it the first time. But the point is, is that we, we need to be sure that we are following Jesus. That we're not like the crowd coming in when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. Oh, hail king. And then a week later, crucify him. We don't want to be like that. We want Jesus to be the king of our hearts forever. And I hope, I hope he is. Because he is our substitute. He suffered for us. And he will judge. He is judging, but he will judge. Uh, uh, someday, and we don't want to be on that on the wrong side of his judgment. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity we had today to come together. And Lord, I, I don't know every heart that's here, Lord, but you do. And, and if there's someone here that just needs to uh, come clean, to put their faith and trust in you, uh, to realize that, that Jesus' blood hasn't been applied to their hearts yet, uh, Lord, help, help them to realize that this morning and, and that they would confess it and put their trust in you. And Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for us and as we've been studying the leading up to the cross and all the things that are going to happen uh, and did happen, of course, uh, Lord, we, we are humbled by, by Jesus and what he had to go through before he was put on the cross and then the death, the, the shame that he went through on the cross. And Lord, we, we thank you that he did that, uh, but we're sorry that it's our fault. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for what you're doing in our lives in Jesus' name.